Mosses. Not a lot of people know much about mosses. Even some really good botanists will say, I don't know my mosses. I really wonder why that is. Well, one reason might be that traditionally, floras, meaning books that are devoted to the vegetation of particular regions, really exhaustive ones like um, this one here that I'm defacing called New Britain and Brown Illustrated Flora. Well, it just includes vascular plants, like its successor, the Manual of Vascular Plants. So the non-vascular plants just got, by tradition, not included in most of the technical guides you'd use for vegetation. When I was an undergraduate student in the during, during the Nixon administration, I wasn't actually in the Nixon administration, but he was president at the time, I took a course in botany, and I asked my professor what this fern was. And I looked in the fern book. I looked, trying to king out left and right. And it turns out, lo, he gently told me, no, it's a moss. And it's a moss that kind of looks like a fern. It happens to be called delicate fern moss, Thuidium delicatulum. One of the other possible impediments to studying mosses is that it's a little, little technical in terms of the equipment that you need. Sigh. Um, learning remotely is a bit of a challenge for this topic, but we'll do it. Um, why? Because not only um, um, do you need uh, a com excuse me a, a dissecting microscope like this one that I'm trying to circle here. Sorry, Cynthia, I just drew on your head, um, which sometimes can be substituted for with a hand lens. Um, but you also need a compound like high-powered microscope like the one over here um, that I'm drawing a square around. Because what you need to do is to see the leaves. I mean, they're kind of small. So, however, that being said, in terms of like how technical they really are, imagine, imagine if you're interested in trees, but an oak tree, take an oak tree and shrink it to the size of, you know, like a thimble. And um, that would be pretty hard to tell what it was, but if you could use tweezers or the expensive version called forceps. Hello, tweezers, $2. Forceps, $10. Wait, they're the same thing. And um, carefully break, peel off a branch of this thimble-sized oak tree and scrape the leaves off and put it in a microscope slide and look through a microscope and see what they looked like. Um, they uh, would be about as easy to tell apart as they are now. Some of them are kind of hard, you know, uh, red, red oaks, uh, um, the uh, pin oak versus black oak versus uh, scarlet oak, a little challenging, but um, nonetheless, it wouldn't be that hard. Similarly, imagine if you have this thimble-sized moss and you blow it up to the size of a tree. Um, so here, for example, are two leaves of two different mosses and these mosses look kind of alike, and most people would say, I don't know what they are. But if you have a chance to look through a microscope, or in our case, with uh, a hand lens, then um, look at this one. This one over here on the right, Pladrionium cuspidatum, is toothed only in the terminal part of the leaf. And this one here called Pladrionium ciliary is toothed all along the leaf. Boom. So those aren't so hard to tell apart. The problem is they're small. Uh, but we have, we have hand lenses now. Here's a photograph through a, through a microscope of what these guys look like. And this isn't so hard to prepare. Um, sigh. So what do we need to do in order to understand mosses is, well, understand the, the plant life cycle, which we do. But just to refresh our memory, a uh, plant has two stages in the life cycle. A stage called the sporophyte, which is diploid. And... It has a, a structure called a sporangium, or many of them, depending. If you're a moss, you only have one. If you're a bryophyte, you only have one. They're sometimes called monosporangiate, as opposed to other plants, which typically have, which always have many sporangia. Within the sporangium, meiosis takes place to produce spores, haploid spores, which develop by mitosis um, to develop into new what are called gametophytes, a different stage in the life cycle. They're multicellular, they're haploid, and they produce gametes in, um, by mitosis, actually. I'm having fun writing with my finger. Yeah, I do better with my finger than I do with a pen. And 
those um, gametes fuse together to form a zygote. Ta-da! Plant alternation of generations, a diploid sporophyte and a haploid gametophyte. So we're going to look, and we already did this with, to a certain extent, when we looked at examples of the life cycle using the moss as the one which, you know, had a dominant gametophyte, and we saw some of the ways that they look. We're just going to do it again, but digging a little deeper. So here's a diagram that we're going to follow through with some examples. But for now, let's just refresh our memory with the major characters. Um, this, this, this is a female gametophyte. It's a leafy plant with, uh, oh, it's not a female gametophyte. Sorry. It's a male gametophyte um, with um, antheridia within which sperm are produced. This is the female gametophyte with archegonia, each which has an egg in it. It's like an egg in a bottle. The sperm swims to the egg with the help of environmental water. And what develops next is the sporophyte. And you'll recall the sporophyte stage of mosses is um, permanently attached to the maternal gametophyte that produced it. And it's not as, it, there's not much, not as much to it. Not as many leaves. It's a stalk in one comparatively large capsule, a single individual capsule. Meiosis takes place to produce spores, which develop to form the gametophytes. Ta-da! So those are the things that we already learned. Now there's some other things on this diagram that we're going to see as we go along. So I'm going to back up a tiny little bit. Am I? Yeah. Really? Huh. I thought there'd be a picture there. Hmm. I think a picture's missing. Well, I'm not going to worry about that because it's right here anyway. Okay, I would like to tell you about something called the protonema. So surprise, a moss spore doesn't germinate and then develops directly into the leafy gametophyte, but rather, I really made a mess of this slide. There we go. But rather, it first turns into a th stage that's called the protonema. Proto means before, and nema means thread. And this is a thread-like stage in the growth form that occurs before the gametophyte stage. And it kind of looks like algae, and it would be really nice to say, since plants are derived from algae, that this is sort of a, um, a, a homologous to the algal ancestor, this filamentous growth form that looks like algae. But alas, uh, it's not. It's a sort of a secondarily evolved thing that, that the resemblance to algae is superficial. Darn. Um, Protonema. And here is a picture of uh, what looks like algae and some leaves coming off of it, of a moss called Fiscometrium pyriformi, sometimes known as the most magnificent thing that nature ever selected, growing um, in a garden plot. And this thread-like stage is what developed from the spores. The spores germinated into this little spaghetti, this green spaghetti. And then the, the, the gametophytes, uh, technically it's called gametophores, because the protonema is part of the gametophyte, but no one's that technical. Um, come later. So here's a picture of the gametophytes of this particular moss. And this is what it looks like in November. Um, there's a lot of these leafy gametophytes packed together, and it's, they are actually producing gametes in November, which is a noteworthy thing. So I'm drawing a little circle here, and it looks kind of like a little rose with a little something in the center. This is a male stem, and it's got um, clusters of antheridia. So, um, and the females are there too, but they're not as evident. So I couldn't draw a circle around them. So, um, from the protonema, uh, buds develop that, that, that grow, from which grow the, the male and female gametophytes. So here's a, here's a close-up of that male part of the, the male branch that I circled before. And um, here in the center are antheridia. There's also some swollen uh, cells in there mixed in with it. So you don't actually see the antheridia, but it almost looks like you do. Um, and here's the, the same plant, plants, or same species anyway, in March. And one of the things I like to sort of keep in mind is that in November, the gametangia were ripe and it was releasing sperm and fertilizing the eggs. And in March, the sporophytes are about halfway developed. And look, in April beautiful mature sporophytes these plants in each one of these each one of these is indeed a plant it's a sporophyte in the life cycle it's a sporophyte stage in the life cycle it is a plant the same way that a freaking sequoia tree is a plant 
um, they grew between November and April, a time that is sometimes known as winter. Winter is not a dormant season. Um, it's kind of a dormant season for many plants and a lot of botanists. They get all, boo, so boo-hoo, it's winter, and I don't get to see plants. No, study, pl study mosses, and you can study plants all year round. And be a moss, and you can grow all year round. Winter is not a dormant season. Let me forget that. No, I forget it. Um, here's these sporophytes in June. They've, uh, they've now, by now, they're, 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 they've released their spores. Um, there's little, just a little empty a hole in the top. Spores have gone out, and and this plant is pretty much an annual. It might be a short-lived perennial, but this is like a one-year kind of thing, and that's the life cycle of this moss. So, um, here's the plant life cycle again, and um, this is this is uh, uh, the focusing on the protonema, and this is that bare spot on that lawn where that protonema was. You couldn't tell it from a distance. Um, this, is this, this is the species that we're talking about. Um, this slide we've seen already, or another version of it. Um, what I'd like to draw your attention to, back up a tiny little bit, what I'd like to draw your attention to is the gametophyte stage in the life cycle. And as we already mentioned, in bryophytes, the gametophyte is the dominant stage in the life cycle. And often you'll see Moss gametophytes without sporophytes, kind of the sim similar to the way you might see, you know, a leafy plants without any flowers. It's not the same exact thing biologically, but it's it's the same sort of condition with respect to, you know, how you approach it. And uh, they're pretty variable. So the idea that mosses all look alike um, and that you see some green growth and you go, that's just moss, like it's an entity all of itself. No, each one of these are individual stems with, uh, with leaves with their own distinctive features. Let's take a look at some gametophytes. Here's a gametophyte of a plant called Campyliadelphus chrysophilus. I stumbled because it was until recently called Campylium chrysophilum. Here's uh, two more gametophytes, and you can see how different they are. See, mosses don't look alike. These are a different er than most trees are. Look at these broad leaves of this Pladrionium ciliaria that are toothed all the way down the margin. And look at these narrow leaves of this Nium hornum. Um, they look pretty darn different. They're just small, that's all. all. Small all. Here's another moss. It's called Brachythesium salabrosum. Well, it's not called salabrosum anymore. They made a discovery that that species doesn't actually occur in eastern North America. So it's Brachythesium something else. And uh, see how different it looks? Here's some more, some more gametophytes. Um, this is one called Entodon seductrix with these flat leaves. See how different it looks? So moss, mosses, mostly you see the gametophyte, and boy, they actually look quite different from one another once you take a close look. So let's take a look at the sexual parts of these gametophytes fights. Here's uh, this little brick wall in front of my house that we looked at earlier. And I'd like to point out there are actually two mosses growing in this wall. And one of them is the one that's the main subject of this part of the part of the um, presentation, which is um, this little one called bristle moss, orthotricum. And you can see the sporophytes and you can see the leafy gametophytes. This one doesn't have a tall stalk supporting the sporangia. And mingled with it, they often hang out together. They must be good friends. Is this moss called Centrichia papillosa. And it kind of looks like a little flower here. And all these little dots are crowded into the tops of the leaves. This moss reproduces asexually. It is not known to produce sporophytes in North America. It only reproduces by, produce, by, by these globular little, granular little... Of Pharaoh's grainy like uh, gemmy. They're called gemmy, little bundles of cells that can break apart and form new mosses. So these two mosses with a fairly similar growth form in terms of their broad leaves and a little rosette, very different in terms of their reproductive mode. Orthotricum pusillum, sexually by spores, Centrichia papillosa, asexually by gemmy. Let's look at sexually by spores. Um, this is a review. Antheridia in some of the plants, Archegonia in others of the plants. Looks kind of like an egg in a bottle actually is an egg in a bottle. This is the sexual parts of that moss previously referred to correctly as the most magnificent thing that nature ever selected, the one called Fiscometrium pyriformi. 
it's um uh, it's a moss that is um Mm, hermaphroditic, cosexual, simultaneously male and female. Not uh, in the same little cluster of leaves, but different branches. So this, this, see how it's forked? Now this branch is male, male, and this one over here is female. And if you were to tease apart um, this one, the male one, and look under a microscope, um, you would see Antheridia looks like little hot dogs that contain sperm. And over here, uh, on this female one, um, Archegonia looks like an egg in a bottle. This moss, by the way, usually, this is a kind of kind of even more insider baseball, but um, this moss can and usually does self-fertilize by having the raindrop that moves the sperm, move the sperm not to another plant, but to, well, it might not be the female uh, branch on the exact same stem, but there could be a lot of them close by that came from the same spore originally. And so there's a lot of self-fertilization in, um, in this mosses, with, by the way, some interesting genetic consequences. Well, namely that since the eggs and the sperm are produced by mitosis. They're genetically identical to each other. So the sporophyte that develops is homozygous at all loci, which genetically you think would be a disaster, but it's not. It's a happy moss. Some male moss plants have some adaptations, structures, modifications to enhance the distribution of sperm. And this is one of them, splash cups. In the male plants, the, the leaves grow in a little whorl so that when water hits them, they can psh, splash out the sperm and help effect um, fertilization. So these are the, these are the male splash cups of um, Pladrunium ciliary. Here's another species that uh, there's a whole bunch of these male, male stems, and they have these splash cups that en enable the um, sperm to be distributed better. So when fertilization has taken place, what develops is a sporophyte. So let's take a look at some of the details about sporophytes and how they vary. This is a moss called Entodon Uh It's a fairly typical moss with a, I mean, it has a fairly long seta or stalk. And here's the sporangium. You'll notice, by the way, that the sporangium kind of has like a hat it's wearing. Hmm. Um, turns out that and here's the, the parts that is labeled, uh, I mean, the mentioned, labeled, in, except for that other thing. Let's take a look at those parts. Um, when the sporophyte is young, I called it a cap. Um, it's really called a calyptra. The intro has the word, it has a C A P in it, C and A to P in its name. It's called a calyptra. And it is like a cap that covers up the young sporophyte when it's developing. The calyptra, by the way, even though it looks like part of the sporophyte, and it will be called part of the sporophyte, it's actually derived, it actually is made of gametophyte tissue. It's actually, see what I'm circling here? It's actually the top of the archegonium that develops into this special structure called the calyptra, which is turns out to be really important. If it's removed, the sporangium doesn't develop properly, and um, it um, might have some hormonal, hormonal influence. It might protect it from desiccation. And it turns out it's pretty important. Next up, um, after the calyptra has fallen off, uh, most sporangia have a lid. Think of it like a garbage can with a lid. Um, and, or think of it as a sporangium with a lid. The lid is called an operculum. And when, the, when, it, when it's really time to release the spores, the operculum falls off. What's left around the mouth of the sporangium, there is often um, what is called the peristome, around the mouth. Peristome. That's what peristome means. It means around the mouth, like perimeter, stone, hole, opening, something. And many times the peristome is um, intricate, arrangement of teeth that move in response to changes in humidity. Let's take a look at some pics. So here's another picture of that 
Entrodon Seductrix, and it shows all of the different structures we just referred to. So here, this one has the Calyptra still, and um, the one I call the cap that's made of maternal gametophyte tissue. The writing isn't working. Um, this one, the calypta has fallen off, but it has the operculum, O-P-E, that's as much as I can get. And, oh, this one over here um, has teeth. The, the, the operculum has fallen off, and it has the peristome. Good. Oh, yeah, somebody labeled them. That was nice of them. Why didn't they tell me? Huh. Oh, uh, peristomes are really beautiful. Um, many mosses have these intricate double peristomes with a with an exostome of these um, segments and this endostome with these teeth, and they fit together really neatly. And as mentioned, if one were to breathe on this, it's not unlikely that you would see these teeth moving as though they're like they're alive, which they aren't. They're just remnants of dead cell walls. They're like zombies. But um, to regulate the dispersal of spores. This is a little cemetery in Marion, Ohio. And right in the middle is what we want to direct our attention to. It's a grave stone on the ground. And here it is in February. And there's this moss. It's a, it's a upright growing moss with... Um, very short, basically no seta, no stalk on the sporophyte, but the sporangia are kind of nestled in the uppermost leaves. And here it is, and you can see this one here that I'm trying to draw a circle around. The black doesn't work very well. Let me try a different color. That'll be fun. Erase all ink on slide. I'll pick a pick a light color like like this like this yellow maybe. How that work better? Yeah. Um, this one has a calyptra. And on this one, the calyptra has fallen off. And you see the operculum, the lid. So the cap, um, the calyptra here, and the operculum here. And then come back uh, a few months later, two months later, and the calyptra and the operculum have both fallen off. And what we have is the peristome, these beautiful teeth that regulate the dispersal of spores. The spores here are yellow, and uh, once again, if this is happening in April, that means this thing was growing before that, all winter long. Winter is not a dormant season. So, um, that's, um, that's mosses. And there are a couple of other bryophytes, and um, we will be very excited to see just a little bit about what those other bryophytes are now that we understand the moss life history, which is a really good example of the bryophyte life history.